the title, 20 years of mesoscopic physics at ONS, makes you believe that we're going to be there until the end of the night, which is not the case. And the, the, the idea is uh, to tell you the story of the creation of that group, which is not completely standard. And I think it's interesting, uh, especially for the, for the young people. So I, I remember the, the meeting we had in the third floor of the physics department, was it in 98 or 90, 99? And the question was after the departure of the high TC superconductivity uh, of the UNS, so what, what should we do? And then the, the idea emerged. I think it was from, uh, from Yves Gulner and, and soon after supported by Philippe Rossignol and others that uh, physics mesoscopic was uh, the things to do and that the, the recent experiment of Christian Glatley wa were the, the one to, to follow. And that's, that's the, the way the, the lab was created. So it was really a top-down uh, creation uh, of, of this new activity. And of course, the hard work was to set up all that, so to, to gather people. And that's where Claude Delalande, who is not here tonight, uh, played a, a crucial role to, to gather people, to try to collect the fundings, and, and I would like to thank him uh, for that today. So let me find my, okay. So gathering people means uh, getting together. So we did that quite a lot. And uh, this was the occasion of entertainment. So you see Christian Glatley and Claude Delalande playing uh, badminton, Jean-Marc Berroir, the coach ever. And you also see Adrien Bachtold, which was not mentioned, and he was here uh, in the early days of mesoscopic physics, he is in the shadow. And I would like also to associate uh, Julien Gabelli, our first PhD student, who is uh, now uh, at LPS. And this was the early days, entertaining days. And then uh, in 2000, Adrien uh, went to Barcelona following uh, Nora. And there was some changes. And in the, in the 2000 and, and years uh, later, so we had the, the chance to, to, to hire new uh, mesoscopic fellows. So first, uh, Takis Contos, uh, who built a new activity, uh, which is called hybrid quantum circuits. And soon later, uh, Gwendal Fell. And some years later, uh, we have been happy to uh, welcome new young uh, researchers, Mathieu Delbecq and Erwan Bocquillon. And very recently, we have been honored to host uh, an academician in the group, so uh, Sébastien Baliba. And this is those people who are honored today by this three physicists prize. Thanks to them. The initial project was called in French Electronic Quantique Sub Nanoseconde des Nanocircuits Mesoscopiques aux Molécules Uniques. So, uh, this needs some definition for the non experts. So, what is uh, electronic quantique? So, it's, the idea is to play with coherent electronic waves, as uh, Gerald said. So, if you take a single electron, and actually it's, it's a wave, and it's, uh, the wavelength uh, is given by quantum mechanics, is a function of the momentum. And the difference with uh, in condensed matter is that the, the mass and the velocity are provided by the crystal itself. And it's not the bare mass. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the very difference of condensed matter. Um, if you consider a system like two dimensional electron gases here or one dimensional carbon nanotubes, those are low dimensional systems. And this quantity can be tuned just with a gate like here. So this means that your matter life is a tunable, uh, is a tunable uh, matter wave. As uh, Gerald said already, so the, this is very nice, but if you want to measure something, you have to extend your wave packets over a dimension which is comparable with the size of your device. Typically in microelectronic, it's one micrometer. And this means, this means temperature, very low temperature, below uh, 50 millikelvin. And from that temperature, you extract also uh, a coherence time because your, your, your wave packet is moving. So you can connect a coherence uh, length to a coherence time just by the Fermi velocity. And the time scale is one nanosecond. It means that below one nanoseconds, you have a coherent wave. And this was the very idea of the foundation of the group is to investigate sub-nanosecond mesoscopic physics, 
which you could call a third generation mesoscopic physics considering the, the previous uh, progress in mesoscopic physics. Uh, let's start with carbon nanotubes. So the carbon nanotube activity was initiated by Adrian Bastol, and you see him uh, with uh, in the in the clean room uh, suit. It means he was the one to introduce us to clean room. And at that time there was uh, little equipment, so we had second hand equipment on an atomic force microscope. And with that, Adrian performed many very fascinating experiments on carbon nanotubes. And I selected here one, which was the favorite of uh, Marcus Butiker, which is the observation of a negative four point resistance. So this is this experiment here. So you have your single wall carbon nanotube. You use multi-wall carbon nanotubes as non-invasive multi-wall contacts. And if you cool the temperature, you see that the resistance eventually can become negative and dependent on the, the, the wavelengths of the electrons with which, as, as I said, are tunable with the, the gate voltage. And this demonstrates that you can have non-classical uh, ohmic behavior with negative resistance. In 2007, so we have been uh, very lucky to, uh, to have a new clean room in the department, which was a, a breakthrough for us. So thank, thank you very much for the initiators of, of that uh, progress. So Claude Delalande again and uh, Jean-Michel Raymond. <laughs> And, and this changed the game. And you see that the we are now it, actually actually this was the takeoff of the activity of Takis Kontos, which started by uh, pushing further the experiments on carbon nanotubes, investigating quantum shot noise, quantum physics. But this went a lot further uh, with, with, in which what, what is called hybrid quantum circuits. And you see here such a circuit. So you have here a coplanar waveguide. On here and there, you have a very uh, tiny uh, carbon nanotubes equipped with uh, different uh, contacts uh, and so on. And the, this is called uh, carbon nanotubes cavity QCD. And the, the, the background of that physics is that you can play with many aspects of the electrons, like its spin, its charge, but also you can induce superconductivity just by playing on the nature of the contacts and their arrangement. I, I call that electronic flavors. Of course, this is in itself a, a, a full uh, subject which would deserve a separate colloquium uh, by, by Takis, for example. But this was not the only thing that the, the QHC group did. So they, they, they also served as a nursery for uh, the takeoff of new activities in the group, which, which are quantum technologies. So quantum technologies is not strictly speaking mesoscopic physics because the here you play with superconductors and you play with bosonic uh, uh, bosonic uh, degrees of freedom of, of the of the systems and this is a quantum team with uh, Zaki Lektas and Philippe Campagny Bar and both teams so the QHC and the quantic teams uh, managed to uh, launch uh, two startups one on carbon nanotubes and one on uh, superconducting qubits. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a topic in itself and I'm not gonna cover it tonight. So when we started the activity, so we had two main lines, as I said, and the, but so things happened during the, during the first decade. For example, in 99, there was the superconducting qubits which developed into quantum technologies. But in 2004, there was the, the discovery of graphene and later on, uh, to a whole family of 2D van der Waals materials. In 2006, there was this discovery of topological insulators and further away, uh, topological matter. So you see that you start with an idea, but we, ha we had to be uh, quite open to the, the new evolution of the field. And for that, we have been very lucky to, to have in France uh, the CNRS. Thank you, CNRS, and, uh, which is organizing uh, GDR. And in, in that case, Mesoscopic Physics Network. So the activity of ENS was not out of the, uh, of the ground. It was embedded in, in a strong French culture in Mesoscopic Physics. And I have no time here to, to, to acknowledge the very important contributions of our French uh, colleagues. 
as time is short, I had to select topics. And I decided to select two topics. So the one that uh, was mentioned on electronic waves in microcircuits, but also another one on graphene, just to add a little bit uh, on, to show how uh, we, the group could uh, uh, adapt to the new, uh, the, the new evolution of the field. But before going to that, I need two uh, basic physics slides, two prerequisites to understand what, uh, the, the, the following. The first is quantum hole effects. So the quantum hole effect was discovered itself 40 years ago. So we celebrated recently the, the 40th anniversary of that discovery by Klaus von Fitzing. This was in Grenoble. And uh, what is quantum hole effect? So it's the, when you apply a large magnetic field on a, on, on a system, you have eventually a transverse voltage which appears that can be expressed in terms of a transverse resistance. And this is what is called the hole resistance. And for, uh, Klaus found that there was a, a plateau if you, if you change the, the, again, the color of, of, your, of your electrons. And there was, uh, there was a plateau a very uh, a quantized plateau in units of, of h over e square, actually h over four e square, uh, since in that time the experiment was performed in a silicon MOSFET. Incidentally, you see that you can do physics in devices uh, and eventually good physics. And the point, the early discovery showed that this resistance here, this transverse resistance, is extremely precisely quantized. So here you see the many, uh, many digits. And, and nowadays we have even more digits. And, and this quantization of the whole resistance is used today for metrology. But here you have this factor four. And where does it come from? It comes from two things. First of all, the electrons have a spin. So th there is a twofold degeneracy due to the spin degree of freedom plus another factor of two degeneracy, which comes from silicon. Silicon is an indirect band gap semiconductor, which has two valleys. And due to these two valleys, so the, the, the plateau here was one fourth of the, this uh, fundamental unit. Shortly after, the people moved to another uh, semiconductor, gallium arsenide, which is a direct band gap and, uh, on the lot uh, cleaner system, where they could, indeed uh, get this h over e square quantization of the without uh, degeneracy of the whole resistance. You also see that this uh, all resistance plateau are, uh, come together with a uh, vanishing of the longitudinal resistance. So there is no voltage between two and three on, on the big voltage between two and six. And this was kind of a puzzle and was uh, shortly after explained by Marcus Butiker in terms of chiral edge state. So where, when the, the, the transport in the quantum hole effect is carried by electrons moving along these edge channels, which are chiral. So they go from left to right in the upper side and the opposite in the lower side. And these uh, edge channels will be used in our experiments as kind of optical fibers for the propagation of electrons. So this was a very important move for the understanding the mesoscopic understanding of, of quantum hole effect. And then since the system is very clean, you see that you have many of those steps and eventually you also have steps above this uh, maximum quantization. And this is called the fractional quantum hole effect. And it was soon after understood that this is uh, controlled by the electronic interaction in the system. And we, we, we can also uh, discuss that in the following. The second prerequisite, is this device here, which we call the quantum point contact. So you have your two dimensional <coughs> electron system and you put uh, electrodes uh, gates on, on it. If you apply a, a, a strong negative voltage, then it will repel the electrons and force the electrons to pass through the small aperture. And if you monitor the resistance, you see again that you have steps here. So one, two, three, four, which just controls the number of, of uh, electronic modes which cross this uh, small aperture. The interesting point is that this operates both in the high magnetic field, but also at zero magnetic field. And if you consider the transition from one to the other, uh, to, to these two modes of propagation, you can define uh, a transmission, which we call D, transmission, if you like, 
And, and, and this uh, defines uh, what is called the Landauer resistance so, or conductance. So the conductance is just the transmission of these, uh, of these waves. And uh, this is very nice, but uh, there is more than that, as uh, Gérald said. So what is interesting is to measure the noise of, of that device. So what kind of noise do we have in electronic systems? Usually you have short noise. So my quantity here is just the, the means the, the amplitude of the of the noise of the current noise divided by the frequency interval where I measure it. And you see that this quantity just measures simply the electronic charge, the current. And this is the short noise, which is well known. It's the same noise when you hear the rain falling on, on the roof. Well, it's due to the granularity of the charge E and the number of charge coming, which is the current. The, the if you this is if you deal with particle if you deal with waves this, the story is a bit different and, and you have a reduction of this noise which is called the final factor which goes according to the transmission of your uh, of your wave so if the transmission goes to one you suppress the noise and there is of course uh, and this was uh, of course a result by christian uh, in this year here yeah. there is an, another uh, way of, of using this short noise measurement is to go to the fractional quantum wall regime. And here the people, so both at the Weissman and at Saclay, could be able to measure the fractional charge. So this time you don't play with that, that final factor, but you directly measure the, the, the granularity of the charge and you find that it's one third of the electric. It's a bit like the Millikan experiment, if you wish. So this being said, so uh, what could we do with that? And, and the idea, as, as Gerald said, was to investigate the simplest device that works uh, in, the, in the assay coupling regime, so at high frequency. And this is uh, what we call the mesoscopic capacitor. So it's this device here. So you have your 2D electron system. You have your quantum point contact, which control the resistance uh, of, between the capacitor and the leads. And you have here what we call a mesoscopic capacitor, which is made of a gold plates on a two dimensional electron system beneath. And so, if you have a resistance in series with a capacitor, so shown here classically, what you expect if you put them in series and you measure the, the admittance or the resistance of the device, you, you expect to get a time constant, which is just the product of the resistance time capacitance. But this is in the classical regime. In the quantum coherent regime, the story is different because you have uh, coherent waves. Your electrons are both in the capacitor and outside the capacitor at the same time, according to the wave function. And the, the, the prediction of Marcus Butiker was that instead of having uh, a resistance, which is given by the, the transmission of the Landauer formula, you have a quantized resistance, which is just half of the uh, <coughs> Previous uh, resistance quantum. So how did we did the experiment, and for that you worked in the gigahertz uh, regime, so it's uh, high frequency. And the the if you measure the the admittance, you you see the. I'm sorry. Okay. You see the here the opening of the the first channel, and if you cool down the temperature, eventually you will see oscillations of the of the conductance which which is uh, due to the uh, oscillation of the capacitance the quantum oscillation of the capacitance and with that and why does it oscillate it oscillates because your your quantum point contact also tunes the number of electrons in in the island here and with that you can measure for example the number of electrons that you have in your capacitor and but this is one, one thing. But the main point was to measure the, the, the time constant. And, and since we are working at high frequency, so we have phase resolution, so we can separate capacitance and resistance. And indeed, it was found, this was Gabelli's thesis, that the, in spite of the fact that the, the capacitance is, is strongly modulated and, and strongly decreasing, you have a tendency to, to saturate the, the resistance to this uh, beauty curve prediction uh, quantum of uh, relaxation resistance. This experiment is performed at very, very small uh, voltages because you don't want to kill the, the quantum coherence. It's 
below uh, microvolts that you apply there. So what happens if you apply a stronger uh, bias to, to your capacitor? And, and this, this is here. So for example, if you apply uh, a voltage bias, which is comparable with the distance between the electron uh, levels in the, in the dots, in the, in the capacitor, then eventually you will promote one electron above the, the Fermi C, which will, after some time, tunnel through the barrier and go to the Fermi C. And then, of course, okay, and, and this gives rise to the emission to the current pulse, which is an exponential, it's an RC time, an exponential decreasing current pulse that you can tune by just playing on the transmission of that PPC. And of course, the time constant increase when you close down your, uh, your quantum point contact. This is nice. So you can, for example, uh, uh, consider the, the quantization, so the integral of that pulse, so the number of electrons that are in, in this uh, small current pulse. And you see that it's pretty nicely quantized. This is, these are the white uh, areas here, and this is the model with two electrons per period and two electrons per period, because whenever you emit one electron, so you, you have to uh, restore your system and then you emit one hole. So in one period, you have two charge emitted in the system and you have a nice uh, quantized AC current, but this is a charge current. So you cannot know whether your uh, Electrons here is just a, a small particle or, or really the wave packet uh, we want. Mm -hmm. And that's where you need more. And, and this is that experiment, which was a difficult one. It's a difficult one. So what is the idea? The idea is that your current pulse, so your classical RC time decrease of current, which corresponds <coughs> to a single electron emission, it's a charge pulse, but is it really a wave packet? And if it's a wave packet, then this is just the amplitude of uh, an oscillating uh, probability amplitude, probability of presence amplitude. So it, here, this is time, but this is also the, the space because your electrons are moving at the velocity. So you can really figure this time evolution as a space evolution. So this is my initial wave packet I'm dreaming of. And what is the difference? And the difference comes if you measure the noise again. Because if, if this is uh, classical, this is deterministic and there is no noise. If it's a probability amplitude, it's, it's a stochastic uh, emission property. And this, just, this is just the probability of presence of an electron in that wave packet. And the experiment was measured on, 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 on this is here, for example, the, the, the noise, the current noise, which is measured very close to the emission frequency. So it's a very, very uh, tricky experiment. And you do see that this is the red point here, that the red point obeys the prediction for uh, wave function, uh, a, stochast a stochastic probability of presence due to the, 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 the quantized nature of the electrons. And this is called the quantum jitter signature. So this experiment was difficult and not very well paid, but this, this was a fundamental one. Now comes the question. So what can we do with uh, on-demand single electron wave packets? Okay. And uh, in the initial program, this was the idea. So you just make a quite complicated uh, circuit with two electrons. So the idea was to play with two electrons. And you inject one electron in one part, the other one in the other part. You engineer the wave bracket propagation. You couple them by Coulomb coupling. And eventually, at the end, you will produce a qubit, so an, uh, a bell state of, uh, of two electrons. But this is a complex circuit, and we have been a bit too ambitious in the initial pro project. And this was definitely too early. And, and that's when the the wiseness of uh, Gwendal Feb uh, came in and he decided to make the turn uh, from quantum electronics to uh, quantum optics. And this is, this is an important slide for, for us. So uh, what is then, what is quantum optics? So you, again, you play with two electrons, but in, in the most simple uh, situation where you, uh, you inject your, elect your single electrons onto a beam splitter. 
And if you do that, uh, eventually the, the two wave packets will overlap. And then comes the question, what is the, the, the quantum state of a two particle wave packet? And, and this question is uh, very dependent on the statistics of your particles. If you have bosons, the exchange of two particles give rise to uh, no change in the global phase of the two particle wave function, which means that the wave function is satisfied. But if you have fermions, there is a factor of pi uh, when you uh, exchange two particles and the wave function cannot be plus or minus at the same time. So it's impossible to have states where two particles are in the same uh, in, in the same wave function. And this gives rise in this experiment to different output correlations. So if you have bosons, then the, this tendency to bunch will give rise to an increase of the, of the noise when the two uh, wave functions overlap and the decrease in the cross correlations because the, okay. Um, uh, but if you if you are uh, working with with fermions, then uh, then you have uh, what we call a Pauli dip, which is a suppression of the noise because the the two incoming electrons cannot exit can only exit in in separate uh, outputs, <coughs> meaning that the the noise is zero, so it's a noiseless uh, partition. And I like to 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 call this experiment uh, maybe in the spirit of Thierry Jamarty. The quantum bento because you you send your you play a little bit with your uh, with with your cards and then you look at the end where where they are so it's kind of a joke so the idea is is is, uh, is, uh, is simple but the realization is, is a lot more difficult why because as i said so we have to inject electrons. So for that, we use our uh, single electron sources, but we have 100 electrons in the dot. We want to select one. But now in this device, you have 10,000 electrons there and you want to select the events associated with the exchange of two electrons out, out of them. And this is where uh, condensed matter experiments are a lot more difficult. And especially you need uh, sub nanoson tri triggering of of, uh, of this uh, synchronization. So how is it made? So it's a uh, quantum wave effect in the integer case. You use two capacitors as injectors, so source one and source two, and you use another QPC as a as a beam splitter. So this is the main idea. <coughs> it looks simple. It's a little bit more difficult to realize, and this is uh, on, on, on idea of the chip. Of the collider chip, so you see it's quite big, and all what happens here is, is right in the middle, and, and, and this is to me uh, the occasion to to acknowledge uh, uh, another 20-year collaboration, which is a 20-year collaboration with C2N, and especially with Yongjin, who is providing us continuously over years with very high quality and, and very uh, nice. Uh, uh, Chips. So we have the principle, we have the, the device. Now, what is the experiment? So this was the early experiment, the first one performed in the summer of uh, 2012, something like that. And you do see, so this is the correlation uh, when you change the time delay between the emission of the two uh, electron wave packets. And you do see a dip. And you do see that the dip extends over a time scale, which is on the order of 100 picoseconds. But what you do see too, is that the dip doesn't go to zero. And that's where uh, electron, electron interactions uh, play a role in condensed matter. And by investigating that in great detail, so we have been able to uh, find out that these uh, interactions, this is due to the interactions of electrons in uh, edge channels on between uh, adjacent edge channels. And uh, this is something that is uh, quite well understood uh, nowadays. But this is not the only thing you can do with uh, an electron collider. So uh, 
as I said, uh, electron colliders is about making quantum optics with electronic waves at the micro EV scale. So this was the, the geometry of the Hongu model experiment. But before uh, we did a similar, similar experiment with only one source, and the, this is called the Hanbury Brown and Twist effect. When you send a, a single electron wave packet and you split it into uh, two parts and measure the correlation between them. More difficult is the evolution of that experiment is uh, what happens if you send an unknown electron wave packet. Uh, a, a, a current pulse which contains an unknown number of electrons in an unknown space. And there is a protocol for that, which was uh, set up in collaboration with uh, theoretician in, in Lyon, which is called topography. And the idea is to measure noise, but now you make a, a collision between uh, an unknown wave packet on a very well known reference source, like a sine wave source, for example. And with that, you can you can figure out what is the the, the quantum content of any uh, tiny uh, current pulse. So we have with that a protocol to uh, to assess the the quantity character of any uh, current pulse. I will not detail this uh, difficult experiment in more details. As I said in the beginning, so quantum matter. Uh, there is interactions. Interactions is eventually uh, a burden, but not always. Uh, interactions are responsible for the uh, fractional quantum hole effects, and which is a new exotic quantum quantum hole state. And uh, Gerard mentioned it. So uh, the, the the same experiment was performed recently by uh, Brendan and his students in the fractional quantum hole effect. So we know already that uh, we have a fractional charge. We know that from the shock noise experiments by Christian, for example. But there was a prediction that in, 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 for fractional charges, there is a fractional exchange phase. And this prediction was, was pretty old. And that's it. And uh, I mean, the, can we measure it? And, and, and the, this this was left for for 40 years and it's only very recently that Wendell could measure it by uh, in a collision experiment by measuring the bunching or anti bunching of uh, fractional charge in a quite modified uh, uh, collider geometry. So here the source is different. You cannot use the, the conventional mesoscopic capacitor as a source. So you have to, to be clever enough to engineer a source of fractional uh, charges. But the good point is that in that experiment, you can benchmark directly the, 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 the result of, of the collision between electrons and fractional charges. And the result is very, very, very clear cut. And of course, I forgot to say, but it's very important. The reason why it, it took such a long time to go from prediction to experiment is that we were lacking a, a genuine uh, theory uh, to predict uh, this, the result of, of, of collision experiments. The people were looking at different ways to, to put in evidence this fractional phase. And this was only recently by the, the paper by Rosno and all in 2016, and Gwendal was uh, clever enough to understand that here, there is a point. I will make the point. And, and he did this experiment, and the, you see here a very clear cut difference in that experiment uh, the, in the cross correlations at the, at the output of the, of the collider. For electrons, you have no cross correlations. You have to be aware that it's a different source, so it's a different story than the previous, uh, than the previous collider. But for radiance, you have a, a strong uh, bunching effect. Uh, and especially for, uh, with, with a slope here, with a final factor, which is given by the fractional number, and which is minus two. So you have a very big signal here. And this experiment opened the way to a new field, I would say. And, and of course, uh, this is uh, the credit is to be given to, to Gwendal. And it's a new research direction. For the laboratory. 
OK, mesoscopic physics, I mentioned that we, we had during the first decade the, the intrusion of, of different uh, materials of interest, graphene and topological insulators. And further away, topological matter. Topological insulators, I have no time to detail. I will just say a few words on it. It's, it's another semiconductor, other type of semiconductors where you have new quantum effects, which is called quantum spin-all effects. For example, which was predicted by Andrei Bernevik and shortly after measured uh, in Würzburg in the team of uh, Lorenz and Molotin. And Erwan Bocquillon uh, spent some time as a postdoc uh, in that team. And when he came back, he was the one to, to drive this activity on, on topological insulator. So, I will not, of course, again, give all the details of, of what you did, both in the postdoc and, and here in the lab. I just want to show one uh, uh, nice experiment to me, at least, is uh, which appears if you uh, make a junction between a topological insulator and a normal insulator. So let me detail a little bit. First of all, these insulators are not insulators, they are semiconductors. So they are narrow band gap semiconductors. But in the conventional semiconductor, so you have a valence band and a conduction band, and the symmetry of the wave function is more like S type in the conduction band and more like P type in the valence band. I hope that uh, Gerald will not contradict me. <laughs> and in the in, in, the, in those materials where you have heavy uh, mercury, for example, not really heavy, you can eventually have an inversion of that symmetry. And if you make a junction between a conventional semiconductor and an inverted one, you will have necessary new states, which are direct states, emerging at the interface between, between them both. What we did uh, with Erwan and, uh, was to uh, investigate the effect of an electric field on, on blue space. And we discovered what is called the relativistic field effect. So the experiment is done at zero magnetic field. But for electrons, for Dirac electrons, moving in the perpendicular electric field here, so they move in the plane here, and they, they feel the, the the gate electric field here. So this is an example of this sample. Then they feel like a, a, an apparent magnetic field, which is just given by relativity. And, and, and this gives rise to uh, oscillations of the resistance or conductance when you increase not the magnetic field, but the electric field. So it's a electroconductance quantum oscillation when we are used to uh, magnetoconductance oscillation. And the, the clue of that experiment came with a collaboration with a theoretician at LPS. And the, the, the clue of that is the, the existence of Landau states associated with this relativistic field effect. And we could explain completely quantitatively uh, the, these features and many others with this simple idea. So this is a, a, a first uh, hints uh, on, on this uh, direct physics. Um, samples were provided by, by Virgil. So this is my transition. Some famous physicists said once that uh, God made the bulk and the surface was invented by the devil. So it's very philosophical. I'm not sure I agree with that because I spent 40 years in doing transport measurements and it was most of the time surface effect or edge effect. So I'm supposed to be the devil then. Um, but anyway, in 2004, so Gaiman Novozelov uh, invented or discovered the graphene. So, graphene, is, yeah. so this is an Arctic view of graphene. So, this is a one atom thick layer of uh, a crystal, which is both uh, a bulk on a surface. So, then there is no issue about gold and evil anymore. So, what is the bulk of graphene? So the bulk of graphene, the, the, the graphene bulk has uh, robust Dirac families. And, and this comes from the symmetry of this uh, network. It's a bit more regular than, than this picture. It's called a chicken wire or uh, 
honeycomb lattice for, for a more scientific definition. And, and, and thanks to this very nice uh, and simple symmetry with two atoms per unit cell. So you see that they are the yellow and the blue. So the electrons, when they, they enter here through the, the blue and they, they go to the yellow and then again, so they have different uh, symmetry in the crystal. And this give rise to a bond structure where the uh, connection band touches the, the valence band at some specific points in the momentum space, where they where, where this crossing gives rise to very robust on, on, on with very robust uh, linear dispersion relation, which is uh, of, of Dirac symmetry type. And what is nice with graphene is that you have a very simple symmetry. Other people try to reproduce that in artificial networks, but here we have it by, with, by nature. But the main point to me is, is the, the energy scale, because this is constructed with carbon-carbon uh, bonds, which are sp2 bonds, which are very, very strong. Think about diamond. Diamond is very strong. Graphene is very strong. Too. So we have here not only a very simple and nice symmetry, but we also have a very strong prefactor, a very strong number, 3 ED. OK. And this explains to a large extent why graphene is so is so interesting. I mentioned the velocity, so it's not quite the light velocity, but I mean some fraction of it. So why is it interesting? So I know that many people complain about the buzz and graphene. So OK, what's graphene? What's good for? I think it's interesting because it's a simple and robust system on, on it's a multi-physics platform which can be interesting both for basics but also for applied physics as mentioned uh, Gerald earlier this is just an example kind of Ptolemy view of physics where you have graphene in the center of course and, and many uh, things you can do I'm not gonna list all of them I just put it in board the one where we contributed at the LTNS on some names of uh, collaborators working on it. So there are many, many things you can do thanks to these two properties, symmetry and energy. I just would like to uh, insist on, on that part, which is the out of equilibrium physics. As Gerald mentioned, so uh, graphene is, is special. So you can provide quite large energies to your electrons on how do they Relax. What is the interaction with with the with the and the for that we use the tool that we are quite familiar with in the lab, which is noise. So we, we are quite good in noise measurements. And uh, the idea was very simple. The experiment is simple, stupid. So you take a piece of graphene, you send a large current into it. It will warm. You know the power that you deliver in it, um, but you want to know the temperature. And to know the temperature, you, you use another noise. It's again a current noise, but it's no longer the shot noise. It's what we call the thermal noise. It just means that if you have electrons in the conductor, if they are hot, they move around. And if they move around, this will induce uh, current fluctuations. And we have these very Another basic expression, which is the Johnson Nyquist uh, expression of noise, where the current noise is just given by Boltzmann constant this time, the electronic temperature, and then you only need to measure the resistance of the device. Out of that, you get. So, this is an example of measurement where you see the spectrum. This is one gigahertz here, the spectrum of the noise, and you see that if you increase your power or your voltage, you increase the noise. And you can extract from that the, the temperature. You also have uh, a low frequency tail here, which explains why we have to measure at high frequency, by the way, which is also interesting, but I'm not going to comment on it today. And what if you do that, you can extract the temperature, and you see that the temperature increases like crazy, a lot above the uh, phonon uh, bass temperature. So the electric. Electrons in graphene can be very hot. They can be heated very, very high. And this is also why it's so easy to measure in a way. 
And the different curves correspond to different uh, gate voltage, so different web electronic wavelengths as usual. What we did with that, so first we investigate uh, the interaction between these direct fermions on bulk graphene phonons, so the, the phonon, the vibration of the graphene lattice. And uh, first we started with uh, low or medium quality graphene, diffusive graphene. Why we, do, why we did that? Because uh, there is another pathway to cool the electrons, which is just the heat conduction by the electrons. So you know that if you take a piece of metal out of the oven, you will burn yourself because the electrons in the metal, they conduct very well the, the heat. And in order to suppress that, we had to suppress the, re the, the conductance. And, and, and this is why we use diffusive graphene first. And if you do that, you, if, and you increase your uh, power, you first have a, a T square increase, which is just heat conduction. And that, then you go to uh, another regime where the, uh, the power goes like the force power of the temperature, so the heating the cooling power goes like the fourth power of the temperature, and then it goes to the third power. And the fourth power of the temperature is just a bare consequence of the 2D character of phonons and momentum conservations when one electron here will scatter to that place by just uh, emitting or absorbing uh, a phonon. And this is the valuable phonon space, which is just given by the temperature. This was uh, the first time it was measured in, in, in two dimensions, and it works very well. But then in graphene, you can you can tune the you can tune the the doping. You can tune your Fermi surface. You can tune your electronic wavelengths a lot. And if you shrink it, then you get into that problem. So you want to uh, relax energy by scattering uh, your electrons on on the Fermi disk. But uh, you are limited uh, because uh, you cannot use all the phonons around due to momentum conservation laws. And, and that's where we found out that uh, this mechanism, which is usually not very relevant in other systems, which is a three body collision, so electron phonon impurity, give rise to another quite efficient uh, cooling mechanism, which, which we call the super collision. All in all, these experiments tells you that uh, momentum, momentum conservation works. It does exist. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't be able to get that. If you increase a little, ah, okay. First of all, uh, there was a uh, there was a, an important move uh, in technology. So in our field, it's important to follow the the technology uh, <coughs> evolution. And, and this was carried by the Columbia Group, Corridin started in 2010, and then this, this is a picture of 2013, when they, they realized that uh, since it's a ball, but also a surface, so you need to control your, your environment. So what do you put uh, outside? And they figure out that if you use hexagonal boron nitride, which is just the cousin of graphene, where you replace two carbon atoms by one bore and one nitrogen, which are just the neighbor on the Mandelier. So you get more or less the same crystal, the same parameters. So they are very, very much compatible. But then the effect uh, uh, on, on electronics is drastic. So in one case, uh, you have your uh, gapless direct fermions. There is no band gap and your material is graphite, it's black. In the other case, by just uh, due to the different uh, lifting of the on-site degeneracy of the, uh, of the two sides here, you have a very strong band gap, six electron volts, and your system should be transparent. Actually, it's white, but this is are often called black and white graphite. So they are really uh, cousins. And if you use scotch to exfoliate them, you can pile them up and realize this kind of stack, which is a thick boron nitride. This is a, a transmission electron micrograph picture not taken here, taken in Colombia. And you see that you, you can nest very nicely your graphite, your graphene layer in between the crystal, and you hardly see that you have changed from, from semi-metallic to, to strong insulator. 
And I, I like to call this uh, procedure black and white graphite sketch, some black and white sketch, for those who remember a little bit the old Scottish stories. On the point that uh, we had, uh, we have in the physics department a very efficient in room, very good, and, and we, we can nowadays uh, reproduce this technique quite well and obtain uh, up to date, uh, high quality stacks of, of uh, boron nitride, uh, graphene, and boron nitride, and eventually use graphite gates. And, and, and this is the nesting room bar for, for the young people. So what happens if you if you if you what what changes if you go to this system? So first of all, you you get a much higher mobility because your graphene is very happy to have to fit the cousins around, and, and there is no lattice distortion. It, it, it's very good. So you have a very high mobility, and if you reproduce your experiment in that system, so you go to higher currents, you go to higher powers. But there is a surprise. So your uh, temperature increases, but then suddenly drops. And this was a puzzle for us for some years until uh, we discussed with our optics friends. So if we are the devil, we had got with us because these are spectroscopists. And, and, uh, and then uh, we realized that uh, this, this is quite. A, Incredible. So you increase the power, you heat more, and it gets colder. So what happens? And, and the hap the, what happens was the, uh, the switching <laughs> on of a new radiative mechanism, which is a, a new cooling mechanism, which is radiative. And this is quite rare in, in quantum matter. Um, is, is it me? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, on, uh, on, on the okay, the reason why uh, this uh, mechanism is so efficient is that the cousins they have very well matched in, in, in impedance and on the, the the power that the graphene can emit very well radiates into the modes of this uh, very nitride uh, question. Now the, the situation is in the good hands of Emmanuel Baudin. With many new ideas, and, and uh, one of them was to say, "Okay, uh, how can we be sure that this is really light? This is really radiated. It, it, it's light matter, but it, is it is it real light?" And this was the, the question of Emmanuel. And, and for that, he, he set up a, a new experiment in collaboration with the Langevin Institute, where uh, we've been trying to extract a little bit of that strong power that goes into the boron nitride using. Caterers, for example, and he, he, he indeed uh, found that that we have a big, uh, uh, big emission right at the energy of those uh, specific boron nitride modes. So we have a new system where we can eventually produce and control mid infrared light. So this is mid infrared. I don't know if you are familiar with it. Ten micrometer uh, wavelengths, and, and this is something which comes from the excellent coupling between Dirac electrons on uh, boron nitride. So this is something that happens in the 2D uh, Van der Waals world, but that you can harness to produce new, uh, new types uh, of light. So I think after 10 years, more or less, so we have understood quite a lot about uh, out equilibrium electrons in graphene. And the question is, can we use it for something else? Usually when you make some progress at some stage, there are new possibilities that happen. And I, I would like to show one example of that, which is the contribution to uh, QED field theory. This, this will be my last slide. And uh, so we have engineered by chance, by intention, alpha, alpha say, uh, a new type of transistors where you have graphite gates, boron nitride, graphene, boron nitride. And it happens that this, uh, if you measure the current as function of voltage in these devices, which are again MOSFETs, not silicon MOSFETs like uh, in the first slide, uh, clouds from fencing, but graphene MOSFETs, then you have a, a very strong current saturation, which is very strange. 
You cannot understand that without a banga. There is no, no way to understand that without a banga. So there is something which happens and we, we work on it. It's not yet uh, fully understood, but we work on it. And the idea is that we have made uh, a relativistic Dirac Riemann jet uh, in graphene MOSFET, which are accelerated by the voltage of the uh, MOSFET itself. And uh, it's hard to, 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 to see the details of this saturation, but if you take the derivative, you have the resistance and you see that you have a very strong increase of resistance when you accelerate it. So we reach, uh, we reach uh, 0.998 of the Fermi velocity. So we managed to take all those 2D electrons and send them in a very <coughs> focused relativistic jet. And at some stage, it stopped. And, and then the, the, the resistance drops or the current increases. And where does that come from? And the idea is that it's, it's the Schwinger effect, actually. And the Schwinger effect is something that was proposed or uh, produced long ago, so uh, 70 and uh, 90 years ago. And the, the physics of Schwinger effect is that if you, if you take a, a vacuum and you put it in a electric field, better try a, a large electric field. Then eventually you will, you will break that vacuum and produce matter antimatter, so electron positron uh, particles from nothing just by the electric field. The electric field you need for that are extremely large, 10 to 18 volt per meter. So this has not been done yet. People try with, with uh, powerful lasers to, to, to obtain that, but it's not done yet. And, and the idea is that it's not done in graphene either, but, but we, you, we can analyze a, a mesoscopic variant of the Schwinger effect in, in graphene, where this breakdown electric field is given by the, the, the rest energy of the particle, which is hundreds of, of kilo EV for electrons, but which can be small or tunable at least in graphene, and which is typically on the order of, of a fraction of EV. And you substitute the light velocity by the Fermi velocity, and then you have electric fields which are just the one that we, we produce in these accelerators. And this was just a teaser for, just to show you that if you make some step-by-step -step progress in the field, eventually there can be some, some opening to new activity. So it's time for me now to, go to the management section. So first of all, this was not done without help of theoreticians. You see here the late uh, Marcus Butiker in Cargel, who was explaining us the matrix of diffusion. And uh, his uh, former uh, students or, or collaborators, Christian Flint, Shannon, Bichard. We have also a very strong collaboration with Pascal de Jurani in Toulon. No? Oh, no, this is perfect. OK. Uh, <laughs> We have a, a good collaboration with a theoretician in Marseille, Christophe Mora, who is now moved elsewhere, people in Orsay, as I said, and eventually also Jan Proust from uh, for the Kisai energy uh, issues. We are aware that mesoscopic endeavor has put a heavy load on the NS services, and we would like to thank the administration, Anne Matignon, for the gestion, for informatique. Laboratory building was also, it was very important. So Didier and Jean-Marc, especially Didier, should be, should be uh, acknowledged. Cryogenie, of course, Olivier and Florent, and also electronic circuits. I, I, no time to mention, but uh, I mean, the circuitry of these four panel waveguides is by no way simple, and, and we have been very happy to have this help. And of course, mechanical parts, I, I didn't have time to show, but uh, we had to to make custom mechanical parts that fits in the diffusion fridges. And we, this is what I call in my abstract, the, the unique ENS environment. I'm not sure that this is the future. And the clean room. And uh, we have been very lucky uh, that the department decided that we need a clean room. And we have been the main users. And you see here, uh, uh, scanning electron lithography, metal deposition, we have also benefited from the heavy uh, clean room uh, at CBZN. I already discussed this kind of examples. And as I, as I said, so we, we, we now master the, the transfer of 2D uh, 
Van der Waals 2D materials, and this is an example of a seven layer Van der Waals material structure produced by one of our students. But most importantly, all that is done always in an excellent mood. So this, this is the, the spirit of, of this activity. Uh, Gerald said it, but it's one thing to say and another to, to understand it. So we, we have enormously benefited from the talents and efforts of those PhD students and postdocs. I, I will not read the names, you will recognize them. Many of them are now academic. And uh, I don't know, uh, I didn't count, but uh, this is as many, many thousands of hours in the clean room. And this was also another heavy duty for, for Michael and collaborators to teach them. But now we have an excellent team and same sort of work. At the end, I would like to end with personal thanks. I would like to thank Julien Bock. I would like to see him today, maybe not. He was the one that called my mother and said, okay, why Bernard should come at ENS for PhD? Thanks to him. And uh, of course, my uh, first life at ENS was Vortex Physics Mentors, Patrice Mathieu and Jean Simon. They teach me a lot in experiment. They teach me a lot in thermodynamics. And it, it's good to know thermodynamics when you want to break it for mesoscopics. Also, my good friends in Alto, and of course, the meso team, Mesopotamy, <laughs> they will recognize. Jean-Marc, Wendal, and all the others. Thank you so much. And also, family, Nicole, Leo, Marion, and Timo.